everyone, and welcome to this episode of Talk of the Town. I'm James Milan. You know, on Talk of the Town, we always like to introduce folks uh, who are new to positions here in town um, to the community and the community to them, one of the main things we do on this series. Um, and occasionally we come up with some really prominent positions uh, that we get to uh, have a chat about, and that is the case uh, currently because I am joined by Elizabeth Homan, who is our no longer new uh, <laughs> superintendent of the Arlington Public Schools. Um, first of all, really appreciate your carving out the time to be here. We Absolutely. know that <laughs> you've got a full plate and more. Um, so thanks for coming. Absolutely. It's great to be here, and it's nice to meet the ACMI crew um, in person in your studio. Yeah, it's, uh, I've I'm, I'm been looking forward to this conversation, I have to say, for a little while. So I'm um, glad to be getting going on it. And speaking of which, um, in these conversations, uh, you know, in the future, when we hope to have you back uh, so with some regularity, we'll be largely talking about school business and issues and uh, of interest um, to the community, et cetera. But I'd like to start today by just finding out a little bit more about you and your personal journey to this place. Um, I know that you are not a native Arlingtonian, um, but just kind of tell us a little bit about, you know, your own, where you grew up um, and how, again, you, you come to be sitting here in Arlington in this position. Sure. Um, so I'm originally from Illinois. Uh, my family's actually from central Illinois. They now live up in the Chicago area, which is on the north part of the state, but I come from the middle of the cornfields. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in a small town. I had maybe about 500 kids in my graduating class, um, but it was a consolidated school district. So big high school, small school, dis or a consolidated school district, lots of different towns coming into that district. Mm -hmm. I started my teaching career in a rural um, town as well, but it was actually a really diverse rural town. We had a lot of students who spoke Spanish uh, who came into the school because their families worked the fields in the surrounding area. Um, and they um, sometimes they would move in and out of town. And so I, I gained my first teaching experience working with students who were learning English, even though I had no experience um, or training in working with <laughs> mm -hmm. students who were learning English. Um, and then I followed some of those experiences through my career um, towards more urban environments where there were more diverse settings. Um, and that has really stretched my practice. Uh, it has made me really love working in New England. I've worked in the Detroit Public Schools, in the Boston Public Schools, uh, in the Waltham Public Schools before coming to Arlington. And I really enjoy working in diverse communities um, in settings that also have sort of a town feel. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I love about Arlington is that it's, it's a town and it is it is compact and uh, you can walk from one end of it to the other um, and it has its own identity and at the same time it's a very diverse place with a lot of people who come from all over the world um, and from a lot of different backgrounds and that's something I've really come to value in my life as I've moved from rural to urban to suburban environments um, and I have lived in New England now for seven years. It's our permanent home, myself and my family and we're very happy here and I've really enjoyed getting to know Arlington, the Arlington community over the last few months too. Yeah, I mean, you you clearly have a quite a breadth of experience um, in terms of the kinds of school situations and the general context in which you have been uh, been working over this time. Um, and nice to hear you describe Arlington also as a as a quite a diverse community. But when I think about some of the places that you've you, you've been teaching already, um, like you said, this is. This is suburbia in a, in a sense, and it certainly, as we know, is a bedroom community. Wondering if there are particular things about Arlington, in addition to the diversity that you had, had mentioned, uh, that really kind of drew you to this job, um, because, you know, uh, for some people it might just be, hey, I want to be a superintendent and I'll take a job anywhere. I don't think that was the case for you, right? It was not. Um, I had a, f a friend reach out to me, somebody who lives in Arlington and knew about the position, and she told me about the position, and so I did a little bit of research. Um, I happened to know someone who was an Arlingtonian and had been a close friend of mine previous to this other friend mentioning the role, 
and she spoke so highly of the town and she was very community engaged and involved and she used to tell me how involved and engaged Arlington community members are in the life of the town, in governance, in um, activism, in just you know the life of the schools. So um, I said when my other friend told me about the role, okay, I'm gonna go check this out and take a look because all of those things are things that are really important to me. I'm, very, um, I'm a very big believer in community engagement from a young age. Um, and I'm a big believer that kids should learn about how governance structures operate in their community so that they can advocate for things that they need. Um, and that's a big piece of who I am as an educator. So a very involved um, populace in a town is something that's very attractive to me. I love being in communities that highly value education. This is a very educated community. Um, and I think that the proximity to Cambridge, um, the proximity to major higher education institutions is part of what feeds that, but also it takes a community to say education is important and to sort of put, you know, for lack of a better phrase, their money where their mouth is. And this is a town that has prioritized education uh, in its funding, in its in its stra strategy, um, in its building of new schools, <laughs> and we're very excited about the new high school. Uh, so those things made me sort of look at this position and say, yeah, okay, I think I'll throw my hat in the ring. And I'm super pleased that it was a good fit because uh, it seemed that way from the outset. You walked into what is always a, a, a tough and challenging position, which is superintendent of schools in, a, in, in any municipality. But what a time <laughs> to walk into this one. Uh, you know, just solidly into the the, the building phase of the new school, but still with quite a lot of decisions to make and quite a ways to go before we all just get to enjoy for a period of time those these magnificent new facilities that we'll have. And then, of course, there is the pandemic, which, you know, amazing, we got 12 or 15 minutes into this conversation, however we are, <laughs> without, without bringing that up. But just talk to us a little bit about, you know, how it has been for you to walk in with with those two things and any number of others um, to, to really try and figure out as quickly as you can. Sure. Um, well, I will say that I was very pleased to walk into a building project. I uh, left one behind in my previous district, and they were in the process of beginning the build. And so I had been part of all the design up until that point and was very invested in that project. And so to get a project that has gone through that phase, and I will say my predecessor, Dr. Bodie, Dr. Jenger, have done an incredible work. The work of uh, Jeff Thielman and the building committee has been remarkable, and they've done all the hard stuff. So I get to watch now um, this beautiful building go up, and of course, we still have a lot of really major decisions and things we need to make sure happen on time safely. Uh, because we are going to school in the middle of a construction project and in the middle of a pandemic, and there are lots of moving parts that come along with that. So we're in pretty frequent meetings just to make sure that all of the pieces of the construction project are moving forward at the pace that they should, um, and that the kids who are going to school in that setting understand what's going on, understand how they can enter the building, and that we're keeping them safe. Uh, but I was really thrilled for that particular challenge because it was one that I welcomed and, and was sad to leave behind in my previous community. Um, the, the pandemic start, I will say, it's um, something else to pick up a superintendency in the middle of a global pandemic. We've learned a lot about uh, schooling through the pandemic over the last year and a half. And so I do think we enter this year in a much better position than we were entering it last year, um, at least at least in so far as the kids are walking into school every day. And mm -hmm. that has been really gratifying. It certainly comes with its own challenges because things are constantly changing. The Delta variant threw us a surprise um, curveball over the course of the summer. I think a lot of us were hoping we would come back to something much more like normal than what I think we're experiencing now. However, um, that our teachers have been extremely resilient to all of the adjustments we've needed to make. Uh, the community has been very understanding of the fact that we've made needed to make some quick decisions and convey them as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're really trying, I think, as a school system to make sure that whatever our protocols are, whatever adjustments we have to make, we get out in front of communicating those as quickly as possible. Um, that we get input and feedback from families, which was how we developed the recovery plan over the course of the summer. Um, and that that be as inclusive a process as possible. And that helps because then we have people out in the community who understand 
um, why we're doing what we're doing and how we're doing what we're doing, and that helps us to communicate it out. So uh, it has certainly been not without its challenges, but challenges that we've managed to work through together um, or that uh, it has just been really fun because we've gotten to watch the high school go up brick by brick outside our office <laughs> windows. Um, and it's getting very exciting as we look forward to opening phase one. Mm -hmm. You know, it it uh, it definitely you were you 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 have already cited the importance of your that you've recognized of communicating um, as you know, in, in as robust a way as possible with not only the school age populations, families, et cetera, but the wider community. Um, and people, you know, well beyond, again, the school community specifically, the people with folk, with students in the schools are paying a lot of attention, not just to the physical plant of the building as it goes up, but to the approach that the, that the schools and, uh, and, and the um, school district is taking to safety of the kids um, work. And, and you also have arrived, not only with the pandemic, having learned, as you said, a lot about it um, collectively, um, that you're, I'm sure you are applying um, a lot of those lessons very effectively. But also, I think it needs to be said, you know, there's a, a, a kind of broad sense of frustration yeah. and, and uh, impatience and, and fatigue for all of us around all kinds of regulations and constraints on our behavior. Mm -hmm. um, so I imagine that you are dealing with that as well on all sides. And by all sides, I mean for your staff, for the students who are the most you know, important uh, in, in kind of the guiding, the, the North Star that, that, you use, that you use to guide things, families and then the community more broadly. Mm -hmm. So. How, how much of a challenge has that been, and do you anticipate that being going forward? Sure. Um, well, we are very hopeful that the trend we're currently on, and as we watch cases dip, is going to continue, and that that will put us in a position where we can begin to relax some restrictions. But of course, we have to be nimble, and that requires a lot of collaboration. So I will say something that's gone really well, actually, has been our collaboration with town officials and the health department and the board of health um, whenever we need clarification, we can call them and they can help us understand how the town is moving, how the schools are moving, and we can move together. Uh, and that has been um, a wonderful thing that I think can be a challenge in, in a community. If there's not really strong collaboration between the schools and the town, it can make it harder to message things. It can make it harder to kind of know which direction to go when you have to make a tough decision and there's, there's conflicting guidance. Mm -hmm. So one of the bigger challenges I think we have had is conflicting guidance. It's very confusing when you have to put together guidelines for what to do when you travel, um, what to do when your child has a runny nose, what to do when your child tests positive for COVID-19 and how all of the different moving parts work. And there's different protocols for each one of those things. And so when we have um, the town collaboration that helps us with the communication of what to do in those scenarios, but we have encountered instances where the CDC says one thing, Massachusetts says another, and our Board of Health has um, been helping us sort through those discrepancies. So that's one major challenge. I think another big challenge that we've noticed is you know, students coming back with widely varied experiences of the pandemic. And um, some of those challenges manifest as mental health challenges. Some of them manifest as academic challenges. Um, some kids had a great time with remote learning and some students did really well in hybrid. Some families really had a lot of time to spend together and gain some perspective about that and are really good about protecting their family time. And, you know, it, it's just very varied. <laughs> and what we get then in the schools is all of these different experiences coming back and also, you know, especially for small children coming back into very full classrooms, which can be really overwhelming after the year and a half that we've had. Mm -hmm. um, and they're coming back in masks and they came back in warm weather. And so those challenges have just meant that teachers have needed to be really nimble in a time when they're all so exhausted mm -hmm. and the frustration you mentioned is still there. And so we've been trying to think about how do we make sure we're supporting staff? How do we make sure we're getting out there early with communication to them when something needs mm -hmm. to shift and prioritizing letting them know what's happening um, just ahead of letting families know so that they can be ready for whatever comes next. Right. If their children's um, or if their students' um, 
families have questions, we want them to feel prepared to answer those questions right. before those questions the first start line coming to them. They're the first the line. Um, yep. So respecting that, that they're in that position, respecting the fact that, you know, this summer was a very necessary recharge for them and not all of our batteries got fully recharged right. um, and respecting their expertise because they also picked up a, a lot of new skills in, over the course of the pandemic. Some of them um, we wanted to learn and some of them we really didn't, <laughs> uh, but they picked up these new skills and they need to learn and you how to use them in a new, in a new space where now we're all back in person. Um, and I think a lot of teachers picked up a lot of innovative ideas from remote learning that they are now able to use in their classes. I will say, though, we've enjoyed putting the computers down um, <laughs> and doing a lot more hands-on work mm -hmm. and, having, and writing on paper uh, because we're really finding that we value that connection with one another and connection to the academics and the ideas a lot. And one of the things remote learning and Zoom meetings doesn't always allow you to do is have the same kind of connection that you can have in a face-to-face -face classroom. So that piece has been has made some of those other challenges really worth it. Yeah, I would certainly think so for the teachers. Both you and I are, are former teachers. Um, obviously, you have continued um, in the field, but uh, we both recognize, you know, what the magic is that can happen when you're all together in a classroom and you get to do that day in and day out for a while. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I have many teacher friends still, um, and it was it goes without saying, super tough year. A um, lot of them have been recharged, I've noticed, just by being back in the classroom yes. um, consistently, and that's, that's great, that's yeah. great great to hear. Um, I'm curious, I just want to follow up on one thing that you you were just saying. You were saying that you um, not only, you know, communicate with teachers just ahead of a broader communication so that they're ready for those inquiries, but you, you also are su looking to support them um, in, in whatever way is possible. What are, you know, one or two of the ways in which you're, you're going about doing that? Sure. Um, so one, we do have, um, a fantastic count group, group of counselors and a director of um, social and emotional learning. Uh, she has been sending out some supportive staff messages around, like we have an app called Why Is It Work that teachers can use uh, if they want to, to sort of help them decompress. At the end of the day, it has little exercises that you can do at the start of meetings sometimes too. Um, and we're also talking about like, how do we provide affinity groups for staff um, so that they can connect with other people who are who come from the similar identity categories as they do or can connect around things that they really want to dig into and talk about together. Um, some of these things are things that we really want to uh, enable our teachers to lead as well. So we've been talking a lot too about how we make sure that the teachers are the drivers of the learning that they want to do um, so that they feel really motivated to do the kind of professional development that we think is important. And we're working on plans through some of our uh, ESSER dollars, our American Rescue Plan dollars, to do just that, to um, really make sure that we're building a culture that's deeply collaborative in the schools uh, so that you know, leadership isn't handing down what we think should happen, but we're working up from what teachers see in classrooms and tell us should happen and tell us they need to learn and tell us they want more tools around. Um, and so a big priority of some of our um, effort over the next probably year to three years will be around building out some of those structures so that our teachers are leading with us, which we feel will make for a more supportive professional environment for our educators. Um, and really listening to the teachers because they're the ones doing the work with the kids. They know best what the students need. Um, and we need those voices to be at the front of some of our own leadership practices. Uh, so those are a few things I'm trying to think. Um, no, I'm, I, I, I wasn't, yeah, you don't have to, this isn't a quiz, I promise. Yeah. I was just uh, curious, uh, you know, and, and what I will say is that, um, you know, the idea that, that for teachers, the idea that they would be being listened to um, is all by itself, um, I think, a, um, a tremendous consolation and, um, and morale boosting Fact. And, and I think in situations where 
teachers do feel that way, even if there are really tough situations and, you know, there are, and, and the ground rules seem to be changing all the time, et cetera, such as we've been discussing, um, you know, that, that idea that you're creating, not creating, perpetuating, continuing a culture um, in which teachers do feel genuinely attended to um, and like they can, you know, make their views uh, known and um, and that that you'll take them them seriously. Um, that seems like a really you know just a great place uh, for them to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, given the uh, challenges they face day in and day out, with for all the reasons you've uh, well outlined, um, that's that's a really nice thing to think about. Um, I um, am curious about uh, so. We've talked for a, a bit about the challenges that are coming around health and safety um, while operating before the end, or whatever the end is, I don't know, before <laughs> we feel uh, on top of, let's say, uh, in some way, the pandemic. But also the other big thing we had mentioned that you'd walked into is the, is the school rebuild. And I'm wondering if you might just take a couple of minutes to talk about what challenges, what, what are the, you know, what, what is the biggest challenge or a couple biggest challenges that you see going forward now, either in terms of decisions that have to be made or things that you can see maybe on the horizon and know you're, that you're just going to be tough? Mm -hmm. um, I think that one of the biggest complexities of this project that makes it a unique project compared to some other building projects or high school building projects that may take place is that it is phased and that we are building around the existing building. Um, so the big challenge right in front of us right now is moving into the new wing um, and entirely out of the wing that will then be walled off and um, taken down. And we will be, that next phase of building is basically going to be right through the middle core mm -hmm. of the high school campus. <laughs> um, so as they build out phase two, that's going to take over the courtyard that's in the middle of the building where students love to congregate and have lunch. Um, it's going to move out into some of those parking areas that are currently being used. And so that's going to create some crunches related to parking and outdoor space. Mm -hmm. uh, we will have the brand new wing and the open space that's in front of that new wing. Um, but obviously that's not as big as the lawn that that new wing has now been built upon. So um, we will be crunched, uh, I think, for the next probably about year and a half. As soon as that second wing opens, mm -hmm. um, as soon as that phase two space opens, we will be largely in the new school and they will be building out some of the athletic facilities in phase three. So I think the biggest challenge actually is right up ahead of us. And it's mostly related to the ins and outs of having teachers move classrooms over a February break. Um, all after this first move into phase one, mm -hmm. all of the remaining moves happen in the fall mm -hmm. of the next several years. Mm -hmm. And that gives us the summer to focus on the moves. But I think this first one is going to be, it's going to have a lot of logistics associated with it. I know that our team has been meeting um, nearly weekly with the building team, if not more often, to talk about making sure that everything is in place so that the movers can move what they need to move, our teachers can move what they need to move. Um, and everybody knows where they're going. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, so I mean, first of all, I wanna point out that you had said earlier you you gave giving credit as it is due to all those who've been working on this for a long time and you said oh they did the hard work i get to just mm, no 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 uh they Fair you know enough. i mean it looks one way when you're making the 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 you know the uh, plan and you say okay so at that point we'll just take all of the people from here and put them <laughs> over here <laughs> now you get to actually do that so kudos to you yep. for you know the positive attitude you clearly have now and let's hope that you are able to hold on to it because you're right it's going to be quite a crunch mm -hmm. and the cold weather will be helpful in some ways because the those outdoor spaces that people are lose that the kids are losing mm -hmm they might not want to be in them anyway at that time, but it's also going to emphasize that idea that everybody is just kind of in each other's faces in a smaller space than they otherwise would be uh, in these in these winter months to come. So, yeah. Um, uh, I will say, though, one of the beautiful things about it is that all of the kids will have classes in that new wing because it's the STEAM so wing. All everybody takes math and science um, or has a performing art, and so everybody gets to enjoy the new space That's great. right away. 
Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. You know, if the, the, especially we know with teenagers, you don't want them feeling like somebody else right. is getting, you know, the better deal. Yep. Uh, they're not going to be quiet about that. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, okay, we only have a few minutes left of the conversation. I expected it to fly, and it has. Um, <laughs> but I just wanted to ask, um, you know, have you step back and just talk a little bit about how you see things building from here, uh, here in Arlington with our public schools. Uh, for I, I want to acknowledge also we spent a lot of time talking about the high school because, again, you walked in right in the middle of the high school rebuild. We also understand we've got a robust middle school, seven elementary schools. We'll have time to talk about work going on in those, uh, in those areas um, and institutions with you in the future, I hope. Mm -hmm. But if you could just kind of give us a little sense of, um, you know, what hopes and aspirations you have um, for your work and for the Arlington Public Schools over the next while. Sure. So um, my first hope and aspiration is to get to know more about the community, um, spend more time here, spend more time in our schools, get to know the kids, get to know the families. I'm doing an entry plan that involves a lot of listening sessions with families, um, with students, with teachers, and that has just been wonderful because it's helping me gain a lot of context and sort of fill out the picture that I have and fill in the blanks and gaps. Um, from there, the next step, the next phase, is for us to really think about a strategic plan for the school system um, and what the elements of that should be and make sure that that's as inclusive a process as possible. Mm -hmm. So I will, you know, in the spring, probably be reaching out to community members um, and community organizations like this one to invite people to be part of that process and to play a role in shaping what the future and vision of APS uh, should be. And it's hard to say beyond there because that unit, the community itself, has to decide, you know, what is our future direction? This is an innovative community that wants to see students be involved in their education and be active in their education um, and be activists in their education. So I foresee a plan that really places equity in the student experience at the center, um, that has really high standards for academics, that you know, puts a real focus on students being engaged and active in their community, um, contributors to their community. And I hope that all of those elements are evident in the strategic plan. Um, I'm really looking forward to opening up that new high school in full and having that be a community hub. Like that needs to be a space that our entire community feels they have access to, either through courses, through Arlington Community Education, um, or through coming to the gorgeous new auditorium and the performances we know we'll be hosting there, or to the sports events on the fields. And so I also see a future where that new high school, that sort of um, flagship building for the system and the place where everybody graduates from is a central you know, core piece of the community and of community engagement, and we built a high school that's perfectly designed for that, so. Great. Well, you know, you had mentioned earlier in this conversation, talking about teachers, that there was a necessary recharging of batteries going on over the summer, maybe not fully recharged. I can't even imagine what it was like for you because you got this job <laughs> in the middle of your summer, so absolutely no recharging for you. Not really. Um, hopefully, you can continue to roll forward yourself um, with, with the, again, the energy we can tell um, you're bringing to this. And uh, we really look forward to future conversations with you as the uh, home and tenure takes takes shape and takes hold uh, here. So thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm looking do forward to back. more conversations. I will come back. Great. <laughs> so glad to hear that. I have been speaking with our new superintendent of public schools, Elizabeth Homan, who uh, was kind enough to join us in the middle of yet another busy day and will hope, as I said, to have her do so in the future. This has been Talk of the Town. I'm James Milan. Thanks so much to you and thanks so much to you. We'll see you next time.